morning. morning. My title is Jesus Prays for Us. Let's pray. Our gracious, uh, holy, and almighty Father in heaven, we come to you uh, as we are uh, in need. We come to you uh, unworthy. But we come to you uh, boldly in the name of Jesus. For you have given us the privilege of knowing you and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Father, please speak to us through your holy word and your Holy Spirit that we may draw near to Jesus, our great high priest and intercessor, our advocate. We may uh, take to heart his, his prayer for us, for his disciples, and for himself. I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. 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 My key verse is verse 21. That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. May we read this verse together, please? That all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Did you know that this is our our church's key verse for this year? Um, It's for the key verse for our UBF ministry worldwide this year. This chapter, John chapter 17, is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. We are familiar with how Jesus taught his disciples what is called the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father. The Lord's Prayer is about 50 words and takes about 30 seconds to recite. This prayer is about 600 words and takes about three minutes to read. But this chapter is Jesus' own prayer, what he himself prayed. Not what he taught his disciples to pray, but what he himself prayed. It is said that a lot can be known about a person by hearing how they pray. This prayer reveals the mind and heart of Jesus Christ and how he viewed himself, his disciples, and the world. The great reformer Martin Luther wrote of this chapter, this is truly beyond measure, a warm and hearty prayer. He opens the depths of his heart, both in reference to us and to his father, and he pours them all out. It sounds so honest, so simple. It is so deep, so rich, so wide, no one can fathom it. Also on on his deathbed, the great um, reformer John Knox, founder of the Presbyterian Church of Scotland, asked his wife to read from this chapter, calling it the anchor of his faith. This prayer and chapter has been called the high priestly prayer, since in this prayer Jesus intercedes like a high priest for his disciples and for all all Christians to come after them. We will study Jesus' prayer in three parts, Jesus' prayer for himself, for his disciples, and for all Christians. Let's all come to the place of prayer with Jesus and learn to love and trust Jesus more. First, Jesus prays for himself. 
Verse 1 tells us, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed. Jesus had given his last words of instruction and promise to his disciples. Jesus finished with a word of confident triumph that overcomes sad realities. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. In Jesus, we too will overcome. Now Jesus turned his eyes toward heaven and prayed. Jesus spoke to his Father, the only true God, calling him Holy Father and Righteous Father in his prayer. Jesus prayed for his disciples to hear. It was the prayer of his heart. Jesus prayed, Father, the hour has come. Throughout John's Gospel, Jesus' time or hour has been the theme. Jesus lived and worked on God's time schedule. He did everything in sync with the Father's will. Jesus listened to his Father carefully and did and said whatever the Father wanted. Now the time had come for Jesus to give his life on the cross as the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Jesus prayed, glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. To glorify means to bring praise, glory, and honor to. Usually, we don't pray for ourselves to be glorified. In one sense, this is a prayer that only Jesus could pray, glorify your son. Because everything Jesus said and did was to bring glory, praise, and honor to the Father God. We learn here that our lives are meant to bring glory to God. When our lives bring glory to God, we are happy in our souls, for we are fulfilling our true life purpose. Imagine that for a moment you set your life purpose to gain as much praise, honor, glory, and pleasure for yourself as you possibly could. Aren't those the very people that you despise and do not want to be like? Who wants their tombstone to say, this person received much glory in this world? Wouldn't you rather have your tombstone say, this person gave away much in this world? Isn't that more glorious, desirable, and beautiful? Jesus' prayer, glorify your son, was not selfish. In fact, Jesus prayed this to save others. Look at verse 2. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Jesus received glory and authority from God the Father, not to lord it over people and to demand their obedience. Rather, Jesus received glory and authority from the Father to give eternal life to all those who trust and obey him. What is eternal life? It is not an eternal extension of this earthly life with all its sorrows and regrets. Verse 3 defines eternal life for us. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Eternal life is not an eternal extension of worldly life. Eternal life is knowing the only true God and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. To truly know the only true God is to believe, trust, and love him knowing that he sent Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Christians know that Jesus is the Savior of the world, the bread of life, the light of the world, the gate, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, and the life, and the true vine. Jesus Christ is the Holy One of God, who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Do you know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent? 
Have you trusted him? Do you love him? Do you trust him now? If so, and I include myself here, then you and I have a great responsibility and privilege to share this message of salvation with others who still need to know the only true God and Jesus Christ whom he has sent. Jesus continued, I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. What was the work that the Father gave Jesus to do? It was to reveal the only true God through his words and his works. It was to show the world that God is living, God is holy, and God is love. It was to die for us, to take away our sins. In verse 5, Jesus prayed, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. Jesus is the eternal word who was with God in the beginning. He is one with the Father. Second, Jesus prays for his disciples. In this longest section of Jesus' prayer, he focuses on his disciples. Even though Jesus was about to go through arrest, trials, beatings, humiliation, and crucifixion, and he knew it, he prayed mostly for his disciples. What amazing love. There are many things that Jesus said about and prayed for his disciples. Rather than going through every verse in detail, let's consider five things briefly. One, they accepted Jesus and his words. Two, they belong to God. Three, they will remain in the world. Four, they would be protected. And five, they would be sanctified. One, Jesus' disciples accepted Jesus and his words. Verses 6 to 8. Jesus said that his disciples obeyed his word. They accepted the words that Jesus gave them, and they knew with certainty that he came from the Father and that the Father sent him. Basically, they accepted that Jesus and his words were from God. Jesus was not an imposter or a fraud, nor was he a deluded humanitarian. Jesus is the anointed king and savior sent from God. Two, Jesus' disciples belong to God. Verses 6, 9, 14, and 16. Jesus said several times that the disciples belonged to the Father and that the Father gave them to Jesus. They were yours. You gave them to me. Jesus also said of them, I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. We know the disciples were still weak and still had much growing and maturing to do. Still, Jesus said that they were not of the world, but that they belonged to God. Three, Jesus' disciples would remain in the world. Verses 11, 15, and 18. Jesus was leaving the world and going back to the Father, but his disciples would remain in the world. Jesus did not pray that they would, that they would be taken out of the world. Rather, Jesus was sending them into the world. The Bible warns us about being attached to the world since it is in opposition to God. At the same time, the Bible commissions Jesus' people to be salt and light in the world, to preach the good news, and to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Four, Jesus' disciples would be protected. Verses 11, 12, and 15. Jesus prayed twice in this prayer for his disciples' protection. Like any loving parent would pray for the protection of their children. While he was with them, Jesus had protected them 
and kept them safe by the name of the Lord. Jesus prayed for their protection from the evil one. The devil is not a myth. The devil works to slander, accuse, and destroy. The devil causes division, strife, and hatred. Then what is our defense? It is the name of the Lord. The name of the Lord is mighty. The name of the Lord is our refuge. Proverbs 18.10 says, The name of the Lord is a fortified tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. Psalm 20, verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen. Five, Jesus' disciples would be sanctified. Verses 17 and 19. Jesus prayed for his disciples, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. To sanctify is to set apart for a holy purpose. Priests and temple objects were sanctified or consecrated to serve the holy God. Jesus' disciples are set apart for God by the truth of his word and the work of the Holy Spirit. Humanly speaking, it looked like Jesus had failed in raising disciples. In just a few hours, all the disciples would scatter in fear. Even Peter would deny Jesus. But Jesus was thankful to God the Father and said that glory had come to him through his disciples. He had complete confidence that the work of God that had begun in them would be carried on to completion. He knew there would be opposition from the world, from their own sinful natures, and from the devil. But Jesus knew that they would be protected by the name of the Lord and sanctified by the word of truth. In Jesus, there was no sense of failure or defeat. Even Judas Iscariot's betrayal was actually a fulfillment of scripture. God was not taken by surprise. The work of world salvation would be accomplished through Jesus Christ and his disciples would be the ambassadors and messengers of this good news. Third, Jesus prays for believers down through the ages. Now is the interesting part for us, because it is here that Jesus prays for us, that is, for believers to come. Look at verse 20. My prayer is not for them alone, I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. This refers to all believers in Jesus Christ, for it is through the message of Jesus' first disciples that the message of Jesus Christ has been passed on down to the present day. Did you know that Jesus prayed for you? Not only that, but he continues to pray and intercede for us as our advocate and high priest. Hebrews 7, 24, 25 says, because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So what did Jesus pray for us? It's in verse 21, the key verse that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus did not pray that every person on earth would hear the good news, though that is a noble task in prayer. Jesus did not pray that all our enemies would be destroyed, though that could be quite helpful. Jesus did not pray that we would have a comfortable life, sort of like a divine take care or best of luck to you all. Jesus did not pray that we would have great success or win the lottery and impress the world, though again, that would be nice. So what did Jesus pray for us? That all of them may be one. One 
like the Father and the Son are one. Not one in the same person, not cookie-cutter versions of each other, all speaking and moving and dressing alike, like clones in a science fiction movie. That's uniformity. We don't need to wear a uniform. Jesus meant unity, which is one in purpose, one in spirit, one in love. Jesus repeats this prayer for oneness in verse 23. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Wow, complete unity. This echoes Jesus' new command. Love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Why did Jesus pray this? He explains the reason why twice in these verses. In verse 21, he said, So that the world may believe that you sent me, that you have sent me. And in verse 23, Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Do you remember back in verse 9 that Jesus prayed, I pray for them, I am not praying for the world. If this made you think for even one second that Jesus doesn't care about the world, then think again. Because twice here, Jesus wants the world to believe. And how does he want them to come to believe? Not through the disciples' hard work, though hard work is good. Not through their prayer meetings, though prayer is good. Not through their private meditations on God's word, though that is also good. Jesus wants the world to see him through his followers when they are one. That is, through those who believe the message of Jesus Christ. And what is it that he wants them to see again? That they are one. That they deeply love one another like brothers and sisters. Actually, brothers and sisters is not enough because we often fight with our brothers and sisters. <laughs> More like a spouse. Well, we also fight with spouses, but. <laughs> or children. No, no, because if you're committed to your spouse and your children, you're not going to leave them. Even though you may have a, a spat, uh, some, some disagreements, you're with them for the long haul. Do we love the family of Christ like that? We should. We should. Jesus prayed for it. Jesus wants it. Like inseparable friends. BFF, best friends forever. Friends, how are you doing? In that oneness and love. Can Jesus say that his prayer has been answered in you? This really challenges me in my goals as a Christian. There was a time that I kept a list of all the people I brought to Bible study or church in one year. I had it on my wall. I don't remember my record, but I think it was about 40 in one year, which is not bad. I felt like this list on the wall of people I brought to church or Bible study was a justification of my whole Christian life. I thought that I showed myself to be a Christian by bringing many people to church and Bible study. And I'm not saying that's bad or wrong. Thank God for 1,222 contacts at UIC. Beautiful. Answer to prayer and beautiful co-working. But at the same time, this is not the most important thing. I have to ask myself, what am I doing practically to be one with my fellow Christians? Beginning in my own church and even in other churches. It seems to me that based on Jesus' prayer, Jesus will be most impressed not by the biggest churches or even those who invited the most people to church and Bible study. Jesus will delight in those who loved the most. Jesus will be happy with those who were the most one with other believers in him. Are we one in Jesus? 
Growing up, I knew a song. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. We are one in the Spirit. We are one in the Lord. And we'll pray that all unity may one day be restored. And they'll know we are Christians by our love, by our love. Yes, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Do they know we are Christians by our love? Do they know you are a Christian by your love? All Christians are, in fact, one in Jesus. We call this the church universal. This body of Christ consists not of one particular denomination, but of all people who love and know Jesus Christ and trust him as their Lord and Savior. Dr. John Armstrong has dedicated his efforts and ministry to the ecumenical movement, which is aimed at bringing Christians from various branches of Christianity together. It was these verses in John 17 that awakened him to the importance of Christians being one in Jesus, based on Jesus' own prayer for his church. In our own church, we've been making efforts and progress at being one with one another. Our recent church-wide picnic enabled us to have fellowship with others in the church outside our usual circles of campus or fellowship. Another beautiful example was the summer Bible school of four fellowships this past summer, Loyola, Oakton, Northeastern, and Family Fellowships, who spent so much time together to have a fruitful, memorable week in worship, fellowship, and God's word. Can our love and oneness even extend to Christians of other churches? It should. We can all make better efforts in loving and encouraging fellow Christians. You can find ways to do this for Jesus' sake. When we are one in Jesus and with fellow Christians, Jesus said that the world would take notice. It is this love that draws the world to Jesus Christ. Jesus has two more things to pray. Look at verse 24. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. Jesus has invited his people to his place to be with him in glory. This will be much greater than any party we've ever attended. Jesus concluded in verses 25 and 26, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. These were Jesus' last words. To, uh, his, in his disciples' hearing before his arrest. The greatest blessing of all for believers is to have Jesus' love and Jesus himself living in us. We have heard Jesus' prayer. Jesus prayed to glorify the Father. So should our life purpose be to glorify God. Jesus prayed for his disciples to be protected from the evil one and sanctified by the truth. And Jesus prayed for us to be one in the Father and the Son and one in each other. May the Lord's prayer for us be fulfilled and manifested in us. Amen. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank and praise you for Jesus Christ, our great high priest, who prayed your will be done, who prayed to glorify you, who prayed for us, for our protection, for our sanctification, for our oneness that you would be glorified, 
in and through us and that we would also be with him in his glory. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you continue to pray for us and intercede for us. How much we need your prayers, your mercy, your grace in our lives. Lord, help us to pray that you be glorified. Help us to be one, one in your love, one in your spirit, one in God's purpose as you prayed for us. Let us make, let us make it reality in our lives. We thank you. We pray everything in your name, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.